I'm Melissa, and um, I'm, I'm with African Entrepreneurs Hub, which is um, the not-for-profit side of Servlet. Uh, we encourage entrepreneurship amongst our youth, and we'll be going out there coming to some of you who are here who are professional institutions, encouraging entrepreneurship amongst you. But this evening, I'm going to introduce our speaker to you, and um, he's in the person of Mr. Patrick Ewa, who's the CEO and founder of Ashesi University. Um, Mr. Wu started his, um, his career working with Microsoft as a program, program manager and um, while he was with them he spearheaded a couple of um, projects, one of which was um, the dial-up internet, um, the pro project on dial-up internet. Um, I think along the lines he realized that he had a passion for education and wanted to come back and, and support his country. And I think it's a testament to his meticulousness that he spent quite a number of time um, researching the industry and finding out exactly what was lacking with our educational system. And um, even took an MBA class with the Haas Business School to make sure that he was going to give us the right, the right product when he came in. Um, subsequently, Mr. Wa started the Ashesin University in 2001 and had his first graduates in 2005. He was awarded in 2007 the Order of the Volta by the President of Ghana at the time, President John Ejikun Kufour. And he was also ordered, um, ordered a, he was also awarded a, a, an honorary, sorry. <laughs> sorry. There's a lot of accolades, it's very impressive. But yes, he was recognized by the World Economic Forum um, as a great leader. He's also been recognized as one of uh, the top, he's been ranked as the eighth best CEO in the country, amongst, out of a survey of 208 um, CEOs in the country. So I think that's very impressive. And amongst a bunch of other things, he's been, he was awarded the uh, $100,000 prize for the Microsoft Alumni Foundation, from the Microsoft Alumni Foundation, um, uh, which has supported the campus for uh, Chelsea University, a uh, beautiful place. With, without saying much, I'll let him talk us through what Ashesi is, but um, please put your hands together and welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I want to apologize for being late. Um, my executive assistant uh, scheduled me for another day um, at 4 o'clock, and then we found out just a couple of days ago that uh, it was today. <coughs> And so I had to cancel some meetings and dash down here from the radio so that's why I'm late. Um, so I was asked to come and talk about the Ashesi story and entrepreneurship. And this is, this is a talk that I've been doing quite a bit uh, publicly. Uh, I thought what I would do today is a little different than what I normally do. Um, we are just about to start our, our next academic year, and we have some new uh, faculty and new administrators, and um, and so they're going through faculty and staff orientation uh, this week. Um, and I thought it would be perhaps a good idea to share with you how I describe the chassis to new members of my team. Because that's, that's another way of telling the Ashesi story. And it's sort of talking with people who are on the inside and really uh, trying to get them to be uh, on the same page with all the rest of us. Right? So I thought this, this might be a good way uh, to present the Ashesi story. So what I normally do with uh, new members of my team is I go through a presentation about who we are as an organization. I tell them a little bit about how we make decisions at Ashesi and what influences our decisions and our decision making process so they understand me and they understand the executive team and others around them. Uh, and then I share with them a little bit about uh, what we think are the keys for our success. What are the key success factors? For, for Chessy. So who we are. Um, this is what people see. When people talk about a Chessy, they talk about it in the way uh, 
um, I was introduced. They talk about our awards. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, Ashesi was ranked uh, as among the top 10 most respected companies in Ghana, um, which is a real surprise to us. It's the first time a university has been on that list, and it's the first time a nonprofit has been on that list. We certainly weren't expecting it. People who know Ashesi see that it's, you know, it's a relatively small institution. It's about 600 students, about a little over 600 alumni. We have an excellent track record, um, a beautiful campus, um, and national and international recognition and awards. So this is what people see. And this is who people think we are as an organization. And I like to tell my team members that this is not a chassis. This is not um, a complete description of who we are. A better way to describe who we are um, is three things. The first is why we exist. What is our purpose? Um, why is a chassis here? So that's the first thing. The second thing is what we do to accomplish that purpose. And the third thing is how we do what we do. So why we exist, our purpose, what we do to accomplish that purpose, and how we accomplish that purpose. And so that's what I'm going to talk with you about um, this evening. So why do we exist? A chassis is here because New Africa. That is why we exist. We believe that the world needs to see Africa renewed. Africans need to see Africa renewed. We are here because we're trying to make a contribution towards the future happiness of an entire continent. That is why I just exist. And I like, I like everyone who joins my team to never forget the why because it guides everything else we do, okay? Now, we happen to think that ethical leadership and innovative thinking are central to accomplishing this vision of a new Africa. We believe that a renaissance on this continent will require a new kind of leadership. And Africa really needs the same things anybody else needs. It's um, ethical leadership and innovative teams and great teams. So that's why we're here, our purpose. What do we do? When I describe what we do, um, I describe it in a couple of ways. The first is our mission. What is our mission? We're here to educate a new generation of ethical entrepreneurial leaders. And we're here to cultivate um, courage, critical thinking, and deep compassion or concern. That's what we do. That's our mission statement. And this guides us in defining the set of things that we do to accomplish our purpose. The second thing that I describe when I say what we do is our learning goals. So we say we're going to educate a new generation of ethical entrepreneurial leaders. Okay. What does that mean exactly? What is, you know, what does every HSE graduate look like, or what should every HSE graduate look like? We needed to be very intentional about our academic program. And if you look at our seven learning goals, they don't have anything to do with any particular major. They don't have to do with biology or chemistry or engineering or, or whatever. They apply to all disciplines. So we want our students to be ethical. We want them to be civically minded. We want them to think critically and, and analytically, both quantitatively and, and qualitatively. We want them to be effective communicators. We want them to be leaders. Now, think about it. Someone who graduates from college does not enter the workforce as a CEO of anything, unless they started their own business. Right? Mm -hmm. But we want them to be leaders right out, right out of the game. So that means they have to be leaders on campus. 
and it means that they have to be great team players. When, when an Ashesi student joins a team, is that person a force multiplier? Or does that person somehow diminish the team? If they're a force multiplier, Colin Powell's word is not mine, um, then they're exhibiting leadership even as a young person joining, joining a team. We want them to be innovative, but more importantly, to be action oriented, right? So a lot of people talk about innovation, innovation, innovation. And most people think that innovation is about ideas. Um, ideas are a part of innovation. Um, you don't innovate until you act. Right? It's just an idea, it's just a dream. So we, we want action to be next to innovation. We want them to be curious and skilled deeply in some discipline. So if they want to study business management, they get the skill of business management. But we want them to be curious about other things. Um, and we want them to be technologically competent. For whatever technology is of their time. So today it's digital technologies. We have no idea what technologies will be prevalent you know, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. But we know that a future leader should be, um, should be technologically competent. So, so these are our learning goals. So I've just described why we exist and what we do to achieve our purpose. Um, the third thing, the, the third way we describe who we are is how we do what we do. And in some ways, this is the most important thing because the how is about our institutional culture. It's about how we make decisions on a daily basis and the actions that we take on a daily basis. Um, and so in a way, uh, and by the way, you, you may have noticed that as I'm talking about purpose and what we do and how, and how we do, do it, we're really thinking um, this is a project of design. We, we have to design the organization to be very consistent and coherent. Everything had to connect. If you look at the logo of a chassis, it is a new Adenkra symbol. We created from the Adenkra tradition a symbol that holds meaning to us. And at the bottom of it, uh, you see a stool, right, with three pillars, and those three pillars are scholarship, leadership, and citizenship. You see a person under a roof for citizenship and leadership, you see an eye at the top for exploration and discovery. So even in designing the logo of our institution, we really went back to our purpose. What is it that we're trying to achieve? If we're talking about a renaissance in Africa, our logo should be African. It should look African. It should have that African tradition of symbology that holds meaning like the Adenkra symbols. So scholarship, leadership, citizenship, that's the Ashesi culture. And so it means it can't just be a tagline, it can't just be words. It, these have to be words that hold meaning for us. And so we defined exactly what scholarship means to us, what leadership means to us, and what citizenship means to us. And then the things that you would expect. Uh, but by the way, this stuff, I didn't come up with. The founding team didn't come up with this. We came up with this. And then we started to execute. A couple of years ago, we hired some consultants to come and interview our team and ask them, what do these mean to them? And so this is what the Ashesi team came up with. The people who are actually living and executing the Ashesi mission. Um, and if it, if it had been a different set of things, then we might have avoided as founders, but it was a real relief to see the definition of scholarship, to consistently strive for expertise, to broaden the conversation 
to embrace fresh thinking, to, to share ideas and connect with ideas and, and be very proactive about it. That scholarship really is about curiosity, it is about humility, it is about being students always, that we have to be students of what we do every day. Um, leadership is about helping others to be successful. That's what leaders do. Leaders help others, societies or businesses, um, communities, nations, to be successful, to get along. So helping colleagues to be more successful, engaging the talents of others, communicating effectively, taking initiative, um, and setting ambitious goals. That's leadership. And so it's possible for everybody on my team to be a leader doing these things. And citizenship is, you know, it's about being good people, right? That's really what it is, being environmentally conscious and socially conscious, thinking long-term about what we're doing, thinking about the long-term implications of every decision we make, every action we take, uh, being ethical, um, having fun, right? Um, living with other people in, in a good and wholesome way. And I would say that the Ashesi culture, the how, is extremely important. A lot of, a lot of organizations and startups and so on sort of subscribe to the idea that the end justifies the means. And whenever somebody says the end justifies the means, then they're giving themselves an excuse to employ means that are not necessarily good means, right? But the reality is, actually, the means define or the means lead to the nature of the end. The quality of what you achieve actually depends on how you do it. And so for us, it's the opposite. The how, the means, is more important. And we talked about the end, which is our purpose. But we cannot achieve that purpose by employing the wrong means. Okay? Uh, so that's who we are at a chassis. And this is how I introduce every new team member to the Ashesi community. Is that don't get too caught up on the awards and the reputation and the brand and all of that. That is not who we are. That is a result of who we are. And the who we are is why, what, and how. And so, classrooms, you know, teachers interact closely with students. That fits with what I just described here. Um, we are their guides. That's who we are. Um, they're just as smart as we are, and they're going to be very accomplished. Um, and they need us to be our guides. We need to be engaged with our community. We're not an ivory tower. The Shesi is very engaged with communities around it. Actually, not just communities around us. We have students who go out to the north, they go all over this country doing community service. Um, if you walk onto, and talking about design, if you walk onto our campus, the most prominent looking building is not the building with the president's office in it. The most prominent building is the library. That is the space that we all use. And that was intentional to say that, you know, there is nothing, there is no one that is more important than anybody else. What's really important is the community is all of us working together. And so even within our campus, we don't see an ivory tower. There isn't one. Um, in 2008, our students pioneered an honor system on campus. And basically what it is, it's a pledge not to cheat. And more importantly, it's a pledge to hold others accountable who do, who do cheat. So we don't prompt our exams. You know, professor walks in the, into the exam room, has out the exam and leaves. Um, and students don't cheat. Well, actually, most of them don't cheat. We have had 
unfortunately, occasions when students are cheated. But fortunately, the peers hold them accountable. They report them. They, the cases are adjudicated by a judicial committee that includes students, faculty, and administrators. Sanctions are applied. Um, and these people who can behave this way, who can behave, who can do the right thing, even when no one is watching, they're the people that you can hand the keys to an economy. You can trust them with a public purse. You can trust them as a CEO of an important company. You can trust them as a CEO of a social venture. Because it's something deep within them. A commitment they've made to themselves as individuals and a commitment that they've made to themselves corporately as, 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 a, as a community. So our situation is not perfect. You know, it's one thing to talk about, all these things that we do. And then there is operating in the environment we call God. <laughs> right? Um, beneath the surface, this is what the voltage looks like coming into our campus. You can almost tell the time. It's very regular. It's supposed to be 230 volts. But, you know, look at it. Look at the spikes. Um, we have to deal with that. We, we can't make excuses that because the grid is so noisy that our IT system should completely go apart. IT system is not perfect. But we need to push ourselves to actually execute. Um, we have a poor road connecting us uh, between our craft and the break so. Um, but we feel it in our backs every day when we drive on that road. Um, you know, the government bureaucracy is not easy to deal with. But this does not mean that a chassis should set a different standard than any universities anywhere else in the world. Um, and we have to be successful. And so I talk about what are some of the key factors to, uh, to succeed? One is good decision making. Um, that's not to say that all our decisions are right. We do make mistakes. But we have a system of thinking about it. And the first is our history, experience. You know, in life, whatever you do, you, have, you make mistakes. You have experiences. And those experiences by themselves don't make you wiser, right? It's when you reflect on the experiences that perhaps you gain wisdom. And so we think about our history. And a chassis is like any other startup. We're not a startup anymore, but we were a startup. Now, I'm showing you two curves here. Um, there's a third curve that I haven't showed you. Um, there was a curve, this is net income projections in our business plan. There was a curve that said we were going to start in 2002, we were going to break even in 2004, and it was all going to be a nice smooth ride. And it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> that business plan was fantastic. Um, and that's what I did in business school. So I did go to Berkeley, and I did do a business plan, but um, that business plan did not survive. So after business school, I set up a foundation in Seattle and we started raising money, we started curriculum design, we started to open an office in Accra, we started to work. And we quickly realized that the business plan that we had gone into this with was not the right one. So we readjusted it to a more realistic one that we thought was the right one. And that's the blue curve. So by the time Ashesi started, this is what we thought was going to happen. Um, and in 2002, we started, and this is the curve we got on. So I, in our second business plan, did not survive contact with the market. So as you can imagine, you know, you have a plan that says, in my first year, I'm going to make a loss of 300,000 US dollars. And instead, what happens is you make a loss of 
it was 430 or so thousand US dollars. Okay. Um, and it keeps, it, it does that again for a second year. And you can imagine, uh, this was not fun. I mean, we raised a bunch of money um, and uh, we were so excited. I was so excited when Ashesi was starting. It was, you know, it was, um, if the power went off, I got excited. <laughs> you know, if the water went off, you know, I was climbing up tanks, you know, looking down to see how much water we had, planning how many water tanks we should get. Everything was fun and games, right? <laughs> if I, if I uh, had a meeting with some difficult government official and they gave me grief, I, wow, I have a case to solve. And I'd go sit down with my co-founder and we'd call our friends and we'd say, hey, we have this situation, there's a government official, and this is what's happening. How should we deal with it? We'd brainstorm the solution, right? Um, but the financial part was not fun because we had raised a certain amount of money and we could see when that money was going to run out. Um, and by the way, just about the time we were starting, the, uh, the dot-com bubble had burst. So the US stock market was on the decline, and fundraising in the United States was very difficult. Fundraising in Ghana was impossible, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Even companies that were sitting on gold mines were not interested. <laughs> So, in 2004, December of 2004, my executive team didn't get paid. Uh, there came a time when a chassis came within two weeks of running out of cash. This was unbelievably stressful. I, I was not having fun. I was not sleeping. It was, there was just this constant war. And it wasn't just sort of a helpless worry. It was scrambling. You know, it's like you're on a slippery slope and you're scrambling. My wife and I were putting in more money. We were putting in more money. We were calling our closest friends. We had a couple of board members that just kept putting in more money. Um, and we were worried that we didn't have the capability ourselves to carry the full load. Um, so, things got so tough, I, I called a meeting with my, with my staff and I said to them, you know, this is what's going on. We're in trouble. The dot-com bubble is burst. The fundraising is tough. Uh, we're giving more scholarships than, than we anticipated we need to do. Um, the cost of operating in Ghana was higher than we, we anticipated. Um, and this was a curve that we were going to be on, and this is where we are. There was a fourth curve, which also is not showing, which is, there was a danger by that time that we would go this way. And I drew that up. We've done that scenario as well. And I said, if we get on that curve, we're dead. So we need to stay on this curve here. And, you know, we no salary increases the next year asked everybody for feedback, input on how we uh, were more efficient, how we cut costs, um, sort of engage our student recruiting. Um, so that's what I did on the Ghana side. And I told my team, I said, look, I'm the captain of the ship, and I'm going to stay on board no matter what. But if any of you are uncomfortable with this, I'll understand if you step away. Just come and have a chat between my office and probably no, no hard feelings, right? And stateside, I was going to people that could fund this gap and say, this is my new plan. Uh, we're going to break even in the next uh, uh, three to four years, and here's how much money I need to do it. And here are the actions that we've taken to try and get there. It's a very difficult time. But this was a fantastic experience in retrospect. I think it's a good experience for any CEO to have once 
You don't want to have it more than once. <laughs> I certainly don't want to have it more than once. But it was, you know, it was a great growing up experience. I mean, this is serious stuff. Um, and so it's affected our decision making. I always think about the money. Um, but here's how we make decisions. First, we check with our mission. When we're thinking about big strategic things to do, we say, does it fit our mission, what we're about? If it doesn't, then we just stop right there. If it does, then we ask the next question, does it fit our strategy? And our strategy is high quality, high touch, excellence. If we can't do it in a way that fits our strategy, then we just stop. If we think we can, fit our strategy, then we ask the next question. Is it financially sustainable? Does it fit our business model? And if it doesn't fit up, if it's not financially sustainable, we stop. If it does, then that's the plan and we execute. And it's very important to have this kind of discipline. Because, you know, there are thousand and one good things you can do in the world. But first of all, you can't be all things to all people, right? You have, you have to know what you're about. And you do the things that you're about and don't have feature creep, mission creep. Mission creep is a dangerous thing because it can get you scattered. You have to think about the strategic realities. And when I say strategy, that's differentiation. What differentiates what you're about to do from anybody else. How, how does your organization thrive without another organization failing or vice versa? Right? If you're differentiated, then you can both exist, right? Um, what, what, would, what can you do that would not happen? That's the ultimate differentiator. You look at the market and there are all kinds of players, but there's something that nobody's doing. And if you don't do it, that thing doesn't happen. Well, that's a great thing for you to do. So that's strategic thinking. And then you just have to be very, you just have to do the cold, hard numbers. Be very pragmatic. Um, and so this is how we make decisions. These three things. The second thing after good decision making uh, is courage and an entrepreneurial attitude. Right? Um, so most people, when they think about creativity and innovation, they think about ideation, coming up with ideas. That's creativity. That's innovation. And yeah, I mean, coming up with ideas is creativity, but it's not innovation. You want both. Now, innovation actually requires, above all else, courage. So you have to have the courage to imagine something different. You have that, you know, it takes courage to imagine that things can be different than what they are today even sort of hold that thought. With this thing that I see here, what if we did this other way instead? Then it takes a lot of courage to act. Once you have the idea, how do you implement? That takes a lot of courage. And you, you have to have courage to persist. Because when you act on anything that's new, you're going to encounter great difficulties. And the difficulties you'll encounter, some of it would be because of mistakes that you made, things that you didn't anticipate. Some of it will be because the environment is trying to prevent you from doing that thing. And this happens in every society, it happens in every company. If you look at you know, the graphical user interface that we all take for granted, it was invented at Xerox, right? Somebody at Xerox, or some team at Xerox came up with this graphical meta, uh, model of computing. But 
but Xerox company didn't do anything with it. Um, and then Steve Jobs saw it and did something with it. Why is that? Well, simple reason. Any society, any company sort of operates with a performance horizon that is understood, a horizon that people see. And then once in a while, somebody tries to push out of that performance horizon. Or they try to just pierce it. They don't even try to push it out. They just try to break through it. And whenever they do, everybody else who only sees a horizon tries to catch them and bring them back. And some of it is actually well-intentioned. It's where you say, hey, you're doing something dangerous to you and to all of us. Come back within the realm of what we think is possible. Right? So if you're a printer company like Xerox, and some team comes up with a graphical computing model, they say, well, another computer company. Why are you guys messing with this stuff? Stop it. Right? So it takes courage to do all of these things. Um, and then this is my favorite slide in my orientation uh, because it's the one slide where I get to use a bad word. So all through my career, there's all these wonderful ideas. And I say, OK, well, we have to have the capacity for truth, for telling the truth, so we're honest with ourselves when something is not going wrong. And there's bad news, we need to know, we need to admit it, and we need to fix it. We have to be very transparent, because that also enforces a certain discipline on us. And then I say, we also have to have a zero bullshit environment. Right? And that's a bad one. And I get to say it as many times as I want. right? And I say, well, what's a zero bullshit environment? Or what is bullshit? right? And and trust me, I tried to find another word. <laughs> I did. I sat down with my team, and you know, the first time I used this word in a, in, a, in a meeting, I had some members of my team like, Patrick, that was crude, right? Yeah. And I said, well, tell me a better word. You understood what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. What's a better word that describes it? Nonsense didn't quite capture it all. <laughs> this is the closest we came to it. But bullshit is things like sexual harassment, petty office politics, corruption, you know, this kind of stuff, this negativity. We, we don't need that, right? And we don't tolerate it. So if somebody joins a team, and I say to them, welcome to the team, but man, if you do this stuff, you're not going to last very long here because we don't have time for it. If you're making decisions based on ego instead of a decision based on the truth, the facts, the interests of the students, that's bullshit, right? I don't, nobody cares about your ego. Um, I don't care about my ego and we don't need it here. Now, even when I'm using this language, right, it is completely consistent with everything else I talked about. Right? It fits the design. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and by the way, I use that word because I don't want them to forget. And I know they, 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 they never forget. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Um, so, so that's that's the Shasi story. Um, I think that we have a, a, a bright future ahead of us. We've come a long way, um, but there's a lot more to be done. And um, we're going to do three things next: engineering with core strengths in systems and design thinking, entrepreneurship. Um, we're going to do an economics program that we hope will be a pipeline to top PhD programs in the world. Um, and here, we, we want to learn from Latin America and China. Right? We created these fantastic pipeline schools. And the people that went through them and got PhDs from the top institutions in the world came back and transformed their economy. Um, 
such a pipeline school doesn't exist in Africa yet. And we in Canada was just become that or one of one of hopefully a few that will emerge. Um, and then finally, um, start to educate people who are who see public service as their path and see law and political philosophy as a path to get there. Um, so that's that's where we're going. But we, we're starting with engineering, that's our top priority. Um, and uh, that's a new engineering building that's under construction. Um, and it's, uh, it's going well. We've raised the money for the building, construction is ahead of schedule. Uh, now we just need to raise money for labs and start the equipment and then we'll start September 2015. So that's your Chessie story and this is where we're going. But the, the reason I thought I would do this talk with you is sort of what I normally do is that it's, it's really a chassis in its sort of most honest form. That this is what I tell, this is what I tell new people in the team about who we are and where we're going. And it goes from the vision to the mission to our corporate culture to the history and the really tough times that we've been through um, and how we've gone through those. And also to just remind people that you know there will be up, there'll be more tough times ahead. I mean, I said we have a bright future, but but you know, in some ways things of when when if you stick with with the means, and you stay true, and you achieve excellence, then you get more support. So um, the engineering program, the board approved uh, the fundraising project uh, for our next 10 years in 2008. And as you know about, in 2008, um, just I think it was two or three months after we approved our capital campaign, uh, Lehman Brothers went belly up. The timing was really bad. And we knew, I mean, it was like, wow, really? Again? I mean, there was a dog farm move. Now there's this. You know, the, you guys who want to, who are playing on the stock market in the US or want to, just come ask me when our next big project is. <laughs> Almost guaranteed the stock market will drop at that time. So you can short. But anyway, um, so we approved this plan in 2008. And then Lehman went be uh, belly up. Uh, but amazingly, somehow, we raised the money for the building anyway. And I think it happened because. We were, what well, we were confident. Um, we were calm about it. Uh, people, people who were considering giving saw excellence, and they wanted to be a part of it. I used to tell my team, uh, and this was this was actually pre-engineering. We, we decided in January 2012, 2008 was planning to raise money for our new campus. Um, and people could see uh, an institution that was operating out of rented buildings in Accra, which are not great. But they could see these really capable graduates that had come out of that and could, and, and could imagine, what if they had a better space? What if we could help them make that? Wouldn't that be even better? And they were willing to be part of that. And I remember telling my team at the time, you know, let's all be calm. Remember, it's not called a, a credit freeze. It was called a credit crunch, <laughs> right? So it's crunched. But somebody's still going to get some money. Let's be one of those. Um, and that's how we've sort of moved in the world. And that's how I hope.
First, I want to say thank you for this talk. And then I'd like to ask you this question. At what point in your life did you conceive the dream of fascism? At what point? Well, the idea for Shesi came um, during a period I call my pre midlife crisis. So, uh, my son was born, we have two kids now, son and daughter. But when my son was born um, in Seattle, I, I started to learn a lot more about the African continent. And it, it, actually, his birth also coincided with some particularly bad news coming out of Africa. Rwanda, Somalia, and I just felt like, you know, there's a new generation coming. And for that new generation, the state of Africa will matter to them. And my generation needs to be part of making this continent better for the next generation. And so that's when I first started to think about what to do. Um, and I thought I'd have some software company here in the that it ultimately changed my mind to do education. Uh, to do education. Uh, and so this was. Uh, circa 1995, 96, I was going through this. 97, I quit Microsoft uh, and, got, and went to business school and got started. Thank you. So, thank you very much. So, most, most startups struggle to find the, the right business model that will work for them. Right. So, how do you strike a balance between you know, riding on your vision and mission to, to take opportunities and make decisions? Or just you know, taking anything that comes your way so that you can quickly make some money and get your business. So that's that's a brilliant question, uh, and it's a, it's a difficult question. So first, in in our model, I, I think. So let me back up. So first, I think that. The why is really important. You need to know some purpose, some higher purpose of why you, you want to do what, what it is you're doing. And then you have some idea of what to do to accomplish that purpose. But you, you also need to be humble to recognize that uh, your idea of what to do may not be the right one, or may not be complete. Uh, um, and so you need to find a way to start small. So what is, what is the smallest viable project you could do? Just to test the idea, you need to test the idea. In my case, I tested it two ways. One was the feasibility study included focus groups with, you know, we had two focus groups and, we, and they had people from industry, people from uh, faith-based organizations in the church, people from the not-for-profit sector, people in the educational sector, even military, right? To say, if somebody was going to try and start a university to address gaps in education in Ghana, what would it look like? Very open-ended question, and just let them have a conversation and record, and then see how that fits with what we were trying to do. We made some adjustments after those conversations. The second thing was for us the smallest viable product had to be accredited. Okay, so we had to do enough to be accredited. Um, we. Initially, thought we'll raise money and build a campus and get started. And they changed their mind and said, okay, we'll rent a building instead. Because what if we're wrong? You know, you raise a bunch of money, you build a big campus, millions of dollars, and it doesn't work out. It's a disaster. So, better to rent, get started, hire people, and see. And you, you learn from the market. Um, 
So our smallest viable product was still relatively large because of the nature of what we're doing. You're taking people's lives into your hands. Um, but for a lot of other projects, you can start really small and test and tweak. So if you look at Facebook, right, how did Facebook start? You know, Zuckerberg built a social network at Harvard and invited a few of his friends to join it. And that's how they started. It was a minimum viable product. And they tweaked it and they saw it grow, 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 grow. Um, and you get to a point where it looks like this is a good idea, there's some validation for it, and then you can get finance, funding for it. So you've got to do this balance of, on the one hand, you know some vision of what you want to do, um, but on the other hand, you're going to do the smallest project that enables you to do that. Look at Google, how did they start? So well, we're trying to organize the vision was to organize all the world's information. And that's a very lofty vision. But the smallest viable product was a search engine with a very simple web page. It just had a text box, a search button, and the word Google on it. And now, of course, the company has become much bigger, but they've maintained that very simple interface still. Uh, and so that's, that would be my answer, is you, you sort of, you've got to sort of feel your way a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, yes. Um, thank you very much for your talk. You said a lot of knowledge and expertise. And how do you build the organization you build? And how do you deal with governments? Bureaucracy. Right. How do you do with it? Because you are coming with a fresh idea that's different. You are right. going to do something that benefits uh, Africa. Right. And but some of those people in offices are not thinking of it. How do you do it? That's true. Okay. Um, so how we dealt with it? Um, boy, that's I could write a book about. Um, but I think that the thing that's, um, there's, there's sort of things that we've needed to do. First of all, we are very clear about what we're trying to do. And we've sort of had that introspection to figure out, is what we're doing the right thing or not? Is our approach, you know, so for example, when we came with our first curriculum, there was a position to it, simply because our curriculum looked different than what the state universities had. It was just, it was just different. Now, when a government uh, official says you need to change your curriculum to match, you know, the three large universities, what do you do? They have the power. They can say, "Don't go forward." Well, in our case. We knew that the curriculum we had drawn up was the best possible curriculum we could come up with. We, we hadn't tried to do something substandard. What we had tried to do was to develop a curriculum that was modeled on some of the best universities in the world and that had been adapted and tailored based on feedback from the people I, I mentioned, businesses, military, social services, churches, etc., by Ghanaians. Okay. And so we were confident in what we were doing. And so that was number one. Number two was to approach this, even though in some cases I think that. I think some of the people we dealt with had a certain level of malice towards us. Okay. There were a few people that in fact had malice towards us. But we couldn't engage at that level. We had to engage with the assumption that this was not malicious. 
And there were some who were disagreeing with us, not out of malice, because they had a, an honest difference of opinion. Now, when you focus on that and make your arguments, and, you know, reasonable people talking with each other, that's hugely helpful. Um, and then we also needed to know um, where our ethical compass pointed. Our ethical point, compass points true north. So in there are a few cases where there are hints, you know, uh, and they never ask you for a bribe, okay? It's all hints, it's all code. <laughs> but you just say, okay, this is where I, well, this is where I stand. And if this means that this thing we're going to be delayed by a month or two months, fine. We'll put up that delay. And it often goes away. So that's how we've, that's how we've approached it. Um, and then I think that the fourth thing is, after we decided to execute, if we execute with excellence, uh, then suddenly we have there are a lot of stakeholders at the chassis now. This is not Patrick's project. A chassis belongs to literally thousands of people now. And those people have a very strong interest in a chassis success. And you know they'll tell me the truth if I've got something wrong. But they'll also go back, they'll actually go back for us. Um, if, if that needs to happen. And so we just sort of proceed with, well, as long as we're doing quality work, all this other stuff takes care of itself. So I want to ask about um, business ethics and the greater good. Right. So what is your, your take on you know, cutting at them some small corners to, to do something big and the price of pay something to, to generate a big impact. So I I don't do that. We've just never done it. Um, I think that once you're compromised, you're in a difficult position. Um, a lot of people tell me this is really there are people who will stop you from doing this. Um, this is greater good that you're trying to achieve. And um, the, the, close, the closest that I've come to acknowledging that somebody didn't have a choice was somebody who was coming across the border between Togo and Ghana. And you know, Togo sites and they asked them for, for bribes and they wouldn't do it. And the guys cocked their guns and said, hey, you will give us this money, right? Now, that, that is not, that is you've been mugged. I mean, <laughs> you've been mugged by the police. <laughs> okay. So, the way one of the ways we make decisions, okay, and I didn't describe that, but it's something that we actually do. And it's not my idea, it's Warren Buffett's idea, at least I heard it from Warren Buffett talking about. When you're about to make the decision, you should ask yourself, if you read about this on the front page of the, you know, the most popular newspaper tomorrow, how do you feel about it? And also imagine that the journalist who wrote the story is really smart and slightly hostile. Okay? They're, they're slightly out to get you. Just, they want to sell a paper. Okay? And the more sensational it is, the better. But they're smart, they're going to be honest and slightly hostile. Now, so you, you do this thought exercise. If I read about this on the front page of the Daily Graphic tomorrow, would I be okay with it? Would I be? And if your answer honestly is, sure, 
everybody is going to see that I did this little thing for the greater good. <laughs> <laughs> and you truly believe that, and you're and you've checked it with some friends around you, and they agree, yeah, this is this going to be a, this is going to be fine. Then you, then chances are it's okay to do. Okay, it means that your society accepts it. Otherwise, you really shouldn't do it. So that's that's been our approach, and I also think that um, there's there are times when, in order to be able to cut corners, the corners you describe, you have to have certain loopholes in your system. You have to have certain loopholes in your accounting system and other places. Okay. And as soon as that loophole is there, it will be exploited for other things that are not to the greater good. Okay. Um, and so it's a double-edged sword. Uh, and I know this, actually, I spoke with someone who's running a business. I'm not going to say it. Actually, the business went out. One other business. Um, when I started, they said, you know, we have this thing and we have a structure so we can do these kinds of payments. Um, and it involved kickbacks and all this stuff. But his problem was that because he had those loopholes, the people in his organization were also <laughs> exploited in the reverse direction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you make the hole in the bucket. <laughs> well, it was just a matter of where the pressure is, the water will fall in the other direction, right? So um, it ended up causing him a lot of trouble. So that's my answer to the question. Um, uh, the um, ways in which you, you encourage scholarship in, your, in the students, you know, what you get them to become critical thinkers, problem solvers, and all that. Uh, um, YC and BC, the way we teach and right. instruct does not take into consideration those things. Right. Absolutely. So what uh, what's the ways in which you're able to, you know? I wait for lack of a better way from that sort of you know system to uh, what you have uh, told us here. Okay. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, you know what we do is the first semester that students arrive at the chassis, they go through a set of courses that are unlike anything they've encountered before, and we just sort of throw them in. Okay. Now there's some of the courses that are about um, scaffolding, they're really about building foundations that, that are not there at the same time. If some students are weak in math, they go through a very intensive, you know, get them to up to speed on math, and more importantly, get them up to speed on problem solving, and then not just memorizing uh, things. Um, but they also get into some courses that are discussion oriented. Um, in our freshman year, they also take a design course. So they're sort of pushed into design thinking. And you know, just being creative, you know, designing different kinds of products, different, uh, coming up with different ideas. So that's one way. The second thing we do is the seven learning goals. You know, um, when our faculty come up with a course syllabi, they do all the things that you normally would expect. They describe what are the objectives of the course, what are the topics they're going to cover on a weekly basis, how is the course going to be graded, um, you know, what percentage for assignments and projects and midterms and finals, etc. But there's a, there's a second thing that we ask them to do, which is they need to describe which of the seven learning goals the course is going to address and how it's going to address it. Right? And we encourage them your every course should address, you know, three or four of the learning goals. You know, on average. It might be two, it might be five, but on average, let's say three. And the idea is if every instructor, every professor thinks about how to achieve the, these learning goals in whatever course it is. It might be a philosophy course, 
it might be a design course, it might be a programming course, it might be a finance or economics course, but they have to think about it and they have to implement it. And imagine students going through four years of a curriculum where every professor is intentionally thinking about this. And they'll all do different things, and I don't know what they do. Okay. Everybody's trying different things. Um, but after four years of that, you're going to get some of this. And that's the advantage we have, is we have four years with these students. In some cases, a little longer. But on average, four years. Okay. And that's how we do it. Two questions. The first one is most entrepreneurs start with a, with an exit in mind. Right. I'd like to know if you have one for us. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Okay. So, another one. Okay. Is, um, what does life after Dr. Gua look like? Life after me. <laughs> <laughs> after after me. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, that's the same as everybody, right? <laughs> by some worms. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, I understand what you're asking. Just kidding. Um, so, um, the first question again. The first question was exit, right? Okay, all right. So, the way I think of exit, right, is that it's not really about an exit for the entrepreneur. If you think about it, exit for the investor, right? An investor, you know, they're gonna give you, they're gonna invest money, um, and they wanna know that at some point, they can exit the company with their money and some profit, okay? So as an entrepreneur, it's really important not to think about exit for yourself, but an exit for the investor. And if it happens that it's an exit for you, hallelujah, right? But, but that should not be the goal. In fact, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur, your attitude should be that you're committed. You're all in. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, now an exit might be that uh, the company is acquired by a, a bigger company, a strategic acquisition, for example, and they pay a lot of money all the investors, including the entrepreneurs, they might insist that you join, that you stay in the merchant company, otherwise they won't do the deal. Um, so you go along and you know your shares are now worth a lot more money. Um, and eventually you'll retire or move to another company. But that's not your exit. It's an exit for the investor. Same for going on the stock market, etc. Now, in our case, we're a non-for-profit. We don't have equity share shareholdings. And so, there isn't the, the concept of an exit for to get your money back and a profit. But, we do have a concept that the people who uh, are donating can exit um, with the confidence that the chassis will survive, right? So, when a philanthropist comes to us and they donate money, that they don't feel like, boy, the day I stop giving these guys money, the whole thing will collapse. They know that at some point, it is operating in the black, it is making a surplus, and it's using those surpluses in the way a nonprofit should, and plowing it back, and giving scholarships, etc., rather than distributing it. And so our exit, if you want to call it that, was the idea to our initial donors that we are committed to building a sustainable institution. And that meant we weren't going to be an institution that was 100% scholarships. We're going to be an institution where students who can afford to pay, we're going to pay. Because that tuition inflow helps keep this sustainable. And we know, and so now if you give us scholarship money, then we can have more people uh, with scholarships. But if it declines, 
the organization doesn't die because of that. So that's sort of how I think of the exit. The second question was, what does the chassis look like after me? I, I guess what you're asking. Um, so, there's two ways to think about that. One is short term, and the other is long term. Right? So short term is, what if some emergency happened? So, Patrick gets hit by a bus tomorrow. What happens? Um, we have an emergency succession plan uh, in place. And what this plan is, is if there's an emergency, if I'm incapacitated in some way, there is a protocol that will kick into place. There, you know, there's a series of communications that will happen in a certain order, like you know, the board chairman being notified, the board members being notified, the chassis committee being notified, the accreditation board being notified. Um, there is information about where all the, my documents live and the passwords to get to that, who the legal counsel is, who our auditors are, um, who the interim president will be. Um, and so this is something that the board and I have thought about. And because in an emergency like that, everybody's under stress. That's not the time to be making big decisions. You want to sort of, things should just be automatic. It's just, okay, something bad has happened. Print this document, start reading step number one, step number two, step number three, and just execute. Okay. And then there would be a search for, for the president. Um, now, and of course, there's a there's description about whether it's a temporary, uh, uh, temporarily incapacitated, or, or if it's permanent. And at what point they realize that it's permanent, and when it's permanent, and so it's not a path. So, so that's all planned. Okay, and it was an interesting thing for me to do. <laughs> um, the second is long term, long term succession planning. And long-term succession planning really has to do with, um, I would say the most important thing for long-term is the corporate culture. If the corporate culture is strong, then a chassis will, will survive. If it's a weak culture, um, then things will get rattled when the founder is not there, when they have the next president. But if there's a strong culture, um, then it's more likely. So that, that's the most important thing. The second thing is to have uh, a plan in place for developing, for growing the guy, the people who are currently on the team. And so professional training of people, giving people uh, responsibilities, giving people decision rights, um, and that's, that's all in process. That, that takes a while. Um, and so, this is, this is how we thought about what happens to a Shexi um, after Patrick, right? And, you know, as a founder, it's actually one of the uh, most important things for me to do. It's one thing for the institution to be successful while I'm there, but the real measure of success is will it be successful when I'm not there? Okay. Um, and so that's that's a long-term, you know, process, and uh, I think we're doing okay. It's not easy. Why, why was there a need to go the non-for-profit route rather than the full pay? Okay, so the, the non-for-profit route, um, there was, 
thinking about the purpose of the chassis, right? Um, and also just thinking about ourselves, the people who are signing the chassis. I went to college because I got a scholarship, a full scholarship to college. And I couldn't have gone to that particular college if I didn't have a So the principles uh, of the chassis uh, strongly believed in paying it forward, having a having a, an institution that was going to be inclusive to everyone. So we were going to have people who were not paying tuition, and we're going to have people who are paying tuition. And this is this is a commitment by by the individuals. The second was looking at what would it take to achieve a certain level of quality that we're trying to. And if we're doing scholarships and all of these things, um, what reasonably would be the uh, net income of this institution after it gets to break even? Okay. And then you look at that, and you look at that, project that cash flow, and say, okay, if somebody were to invest in this venture as we envision it, would there be enough future cash flows that we could see an exit for the early investor? That somebody would say, oh, look at these wonderful cash flows. This, this organization is now worth more, and I'm going to buy out the previous people. That we see ourselves getting onto the stock market, et cetera. Um, and the answer was no. Okay. So, I mean, why would anybody invest in this rather than invest in a software company where the returns are much better or real estate or whatever. So we we weren't sure that there was an investor market for, for what we were trying to do. Um, and then the, the, the other thing was to think about if it's possible to do a for-profit which is privately held. We're not looking for lots of investors, etc. But what happens when the principles are no longer there? Those kinds of, I mean, I couldn't see myself running a chassis as a family business, and one day I die and my, my children become the president. You know, I just, I couldn't see that. So that also was sort of an option. Um, and then finally, we were just looking at some of the most accomplished universities in the world. You know, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Stanford, Swarthmore, you name it. The most reputable universities in the world were all for all not for profit. And so after doing that analysis, we decided that's the model we're going to choose. Yeah, I just wanted to find out if you have any particular programs for your alumni students um, when they leave? Because you talk about having four years with them right. in a chassis. Right. And it's very nice if they end up like focusing, having that culture right. to grow mentally and to be critical thinkers and to be ethical. But then when you leave, you know, you see that there's a bigger world that right. has them for much longer. That's true. <laughs> for the rest of their lives. <laughs> so is there, is there a way for them to sort of get to be socialized, like get back into the that, that, that culture that you craft for them? Yeah, you know, I, I think that it's a combination of the communication we have with them. Uh, we invite some of them back to engage with our students in the classroom. Uh, there's a lot of conversation on Twitter and Facebook and the things that we celebrate. And um, alumni homecoming meetings and all of that. Uh, so, but, but you know, still, I mean, once they've graduated, you know, the world has more time with them than we do, right? Um, the important thing is for them to stay connected with each other. And by so doing, um, I think they help each other, and as we get more alumni out there, that network gets bigger and stronger. That's going to that's going to help. 
Um, I wanted to ask, when you came to Ghana to start Ashesi, um, did you already have in mind how your faculty members, um, who they were, or when you got them in Ghana, um, did they go undergo some kind of training? Okay, so I didn't know who the faculty were when we, when we were starting. Um, we, and in fact, when we put out ads for um, job postings, nobody in Ghana was interested. <laughs> we, got, we got no applications from professors here. It just didn't happen. <laughs> so we actually started, the first two uh, instructors at the Shesley were British. So we, we advertised in London and we got applications. Um, so we got these guys from England and then we had a couple of people from Microsoft who also joined us for a short while. And our first semester, there were no Ghanaian faculty members. Um, and then, you know, we got started and, you know, by the second year, when uh, we put out job postings, we had more interest. Okay. So that was something where we just had to find a way to get started and then people were very risk averse. And you know, remember there weren't private universities in Ghana and there were a couple like Valley View, actually more than a couple, like by the time we started, it was Valley View, Central, Methodist, Islamic, and we were the fit. All the ones before us were started by churches. <laughs> and people felt, it's some guy, he does not have a church. doesn't take a lecture every Sunday. <laughs> you know, what is this thing, right? <laughs> so, so people were very hesitant. Um, and then we also got uh, people who were just finishing up their PhDs in England or the US. We joined the back of the Ghanaians, who saw this as an opportunity to return. And that's really how we sort of been halfway in the mind since Okay. Kind of a personal question. Um, okay. Do you think the MBA you did really transformed you? As in, could you have done this without an MBA? Well, <laughs> those are two separate questions. <laughs> so, um, yes, the MBA was very important. Uh, in my particular case, uh, when I had the idea to do this, it took me a year and a half from when I had the idea and had the full permission of my wife to quit Microsoft. It took me a year and a half before I actually and the reason it took me so long was because I was just afraid of failure, right? I mean, there's a lot of fear. You know, I was here, doing engineering, I was making a lot of money, and just the idea of picking up and going back to Ghana and doing what? Start a university? It was daunting, and there was a very high probability that there would be more. So going to business school for me was really a mechanism to manage my fear. It was, okay, the reason I'm afraid is because I'm afraid it'll fail. And the reason I'm afraid it'll fail is because my background is in engineering and I know software, but I don't know anything about how to run an organization. I don't know anything about accounting, marketing, HR, none of this stuff. So I felt that if I went and studied those things, it would better prepare me. And, and actually it did. I, I think I left business school far more confident than I would have been if I jumped into this right away. Um, could I have done this without an MBA? Um, Certainly not in the way that I've done it. Uh, the, for one thing, the accreditation board wouldn't have allowed me to be president without a graduate degree, just a, with just a bachelor's degree. Right? So in my particular, in this particular industry, that would not have worked. Um, but 
if your question is, is it possible to start a business and be successful without an MBA, the answer is yes. Um, because if you think about what you need to start a company, you need this vision, you need passion, you need a lot of energy, you need to be really good at at least one thing. You need to be able to uh, get some capital and you need to be able to build a strong team right, to get this done. And if you can get a team that complements your capabilities, then you can make this happen so people will fill in the gaps of what you don't, what you don't know. Um, you know, some of the most uh, impressive companies are people who didn't even go to college. The most notorious ones are people who dropped out of college, right? Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Zuckerberg, and the Google guys, they, I think, had graduate degrees. So, it's not required to have an MBA. Yes, um, I'm interested in, in, in pursuing the local content question that the lady was asked. Right, okay. What do you do, or how long?